Hi everyone, uh, my name is Daniel Kataolan. I'm one of the senior research analysts covering biotech here at Chardon, where our vision is to help identify companies with high potential for investment returns based on creating real value for society through disruptive innovation. It is my pleasure to introduce Zendia Forbes, the CEO, and uh, Michelle Michaelides, uh, head of clinical ophthalmology from Mira to the second series of our ophthalmology uh, summit, where the focus is on retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, welcome, Michelle. Welcome, Zandi. Thank you. Uh, to, to start things off, can, can you please provide a brief overview of Mira and uh, the uh, programs that you're developing currently at Mira? Um, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting us. and. Um, in the overview, you'll see that ophthalmology isn't really the only thing or, or the particular focus of the company, but our partnership in inherited retinal diseases has allowed us to build out a company that has uh, broad-based technologies to optimize genetic medicines in general. Um, we have a pipeline of uh, multiple programs, currently three lead programs, the lead program, which is completing enrollment of its phase three is in RPGR. The discussion we're going to have today is about that program. We have a late stage program with sham controlled phase two positive data in Parkinson's disease, which doesn't address the dopamine situation, but circum circumvents it. So um, we've got positive data showing improvement in uh, motor symptoms against sham control, which is the only such data ever shown in Parkinson's disease for genome cell therapy. And we also have a xerostomia program, which has initiated a potentially pivotal uh, randomized phase two study where we have extremely strong data coming out of our phase one, two that was released earlier this year. So those are our clinical programs. Um, through our partnership with Janssen, we are the manufacturer for the RPGR program and other I programs. And as a consequence of that, we have built very broad internal manufacturing infrastructure. So we have two GMP viral vector facilities. We manufacture our, our own plasmid. We actually have just had commercial approval for our QC facility. And we have an internal process that allows us to uh, produce very high yield, high full ratio uh, material. And in our collaboration with, with Janssen, this has been viewed by regulatory agencies around the world when we can cross-reference all of those filings. So we're very strong in manufacturing and we have uh, promoter platforms, capsid platforms, and we've initially invented um, additionally, rather than initially, additionally invented a way of precisely controlling any gene in any context using a small molecule and a riba switch. And that's particularly exciting right now and likely first to get into the clinic in areas of cell therapy, where we've shown very large improvements over the current standard of care in CAR-T, for example. So that's an overview of the company. And I think now we're going to move on to a focus of our phase three RPGR program, which is partnered with uh, Janssen. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, thank, thank you for that overview. Uh, certainly looks like a lot uh, going on and I wish we had uh, time uh, to, to go through through all of those programs, but like like uh, you, you said, the focus here is on retinitis pigmentosa. So uh, switching to that, um, you know, you have your program in X-length X retinitis pigmentosa. Can you talk about that uh, indication uh, epidemiology, um, um, maybe mention what the market size um, and current treatment options are in that indication. Sure, ha sure, happy so, to. Yeah, I was going to oh. say, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, no, happy to. So, so X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, X-linked RP, um, accounts... Can I just interrupt for one minute, Mike, because I think you could introduce yourself. Uh, sure. Because Mike is a leading expert in IRDs from the Moorfield. So why don't you just sure. yeah, yeah, sure, tell sure, sure. the sure. 
Yeah, who I am. Where you drive your expert. <laughs> sure, yeah. absolutely. So um, I'm a, an attending at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. Uh, so I spend half my time in the clinic seeing both adults and children with inherited retinal disease. And um, I see about 40 adults a week and 20 to 30 children a week. So it's a, it's a very high volume practice. And we arguably have the largest genetic database of patients with inherited retinal disease in the world. The other half of my time is spent um, in clinical research, very much trying to improve the design of clinical trials for IRDs, um, endpoints, get better sense of uh, structure function associations and genoty genotype phenotype correlations. And then my third hat would be uh, where I'm acting as head of ophthalmology at, at Mira GTX, trying to drive forward our IRD program and and at the very heart of that would be um, our RPGR program, which is the by far the commonest cause of X-linked RP. And, and that's a disease that is one of the most severe diseases that we see, with RP affecting about one in 3,000 people. And as I say, 20% of RP would be X-linked RP. And these, uh, these children present in, uh, in the first decade of life with difficulty uh, navigating in dim illumination. And sometimes that may be disguised as a, a fear of the dark. Um, and then increasingly they have trouble navigating. They have increasing loss of their peripheral vision as they lose increasing number of rod photoreceptors and have a greater constriction of their field of vision until eventually they have uh, what would be termed tunnel vision, and they just have that central uh, view of the world. And then within that, there's a, over time an increasing loss of cone function in the central retina, and so they lose uh, acuity vision, color vision, contrast sensitivity, and central field of vision, with all of the patients uh, becoming blind by the end of their uh, 30s, early 40s. So, so whilst primarily it's um, it's men that are affected, uh, males that are affected, it can also uh, affect uh, the female carriers. So to a far lesser extent are they as severely affected as males, but they can be um, symptomatically affected. And uh, we've had a, a large number who've wanted to participate in our phase three trial, and we have a small cohort of female carriers that have had treatment as well. In terms of the the, the market size, um, if we look at the US, uh, the five biggest countries in, in Europe and Japan, we believe about 20,000 patients would be potentially eligible for treatment. But given our partnership, as, as Zandi's alluded to with Janssen, uh, we look more globally and anticipate the number should be vastly greater than that 20,000. In terms of the options that patients have currently, there are no treatment options, unfortunately. So they're all supportive. They're, they're trying to opt optimize function using magnification, spectacles, other assistive technologies, uh, and put things in place in education so that they can uh, keep up with the curriculum. But there are no treatments to slow or halt vision or, or significantly improve it. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. Um, so, so switching over to, um, to your lead uh, candidate, MGT009 or Botovac, um, can, can you give us an overview of that, of that therapeutic and, in your opinion, what differentiates this program from others that are currently in development? So I'll take that with respect to the vector. Um, the vector is, there are a number of... Um, RPGR focused gene therapies right now. Um, we are by far the most advanced. There are a, a, there has been one that failed in a clinical trial, um, which was Nightstar Biogen, and then there is an, a, the old ADTC program. Now both of those codon optimize the genetic sequence of the full length RPGR gene, and um, the reason for doing that and the reason for our design of the vector is that within the RPGR gene sequence is a repeat and that repeat is uh, not stable for manufacturing but also in fact in RNA production. So when you clone out of an eye, a mouse, a, a, a rat, a monkey, full length RPGR or 15 RPGR has never been cloned out as a cDNA from a message. 
So there are varying sizes of messenger RNAs produced from this gene with an unstable, we call it hinge region because that's the part of the protein it encodes. And this instability is not good for a genetic medicine. You want the same gene in there at all times. So the other companies tried to stabilize the, the full length gene using codon optimization. This was the initial approach in UCL Moore Fields, where this was initially invented, our RPGR program. And that wasn't sufficient to fully stabilize the construct. So what was done is the smallest, the largest RNA that was found in the eye was cloned. There was a deletion in the middle of that hinge region, the repeat region, and it was used to rescue. What we then went back and did is optimize the size of that repeat so that it was stable for use as a genetic medicine, but we optimized it so it was fully functional, fully expressing and fully rescuing a mouse model. And not only rescued the mouse model, but we have human organoid technology, which allowed us to take stem cells from patients who had gone blind because of their RPGR mutation, grow retinas with that mutation in a dish for nine months. And we were able to rescue the phenotype of those photoreceptors using this construct. Phenotype with respect to localization and expression of the correct RPGR, as well as rescue of some of the features that make photoreceptors functional. So from a vector perspective, it is quite differentiated and, um, and, and we believe it is the best that we were able to achieve extremely good rescue in mouse and human using this construct. There are many differences in the way this has been developed clinically, in the design of endpoints, in the surgery, in the way that we treat the retina, which Mike can allude to when we talk about the clinical trials. But I don't want to underestimate the incredible importance of those aspects of this program just by explaining the differentiation features of the construct. Yeah, got it. That makes sense. Very, very impressive. And uh, in, in terms of administration, how uh, how is this uh, therapy administered? Mike, do you want to go ahead? Sure. So, so this is delivered subretinally. So, um, what we do is aim to target um, all the viable retina in the at the posterior pole of the retina. So, as much of the retina that is anatomically relatively intact and could potentially receive the therapy. And as, as Zandi has alluded to, the surgery that's been developed is aims to do that in as gentle and as, uh, uh, as controlled a fashion as is possible. Um, and we allow our surgeons to undertake more than one retinotomy if required to achieve the broadest, safest detachment of the posterior pole. Got it. Understand. And in terms of inflammation, just, do you? Oh, sorry, if I can, if I can just give sure. you just, just a tiny bit of context. So we find that through one or potentially a couple of retinotomies, uh, using 300 to 500 microliters can safely cover the entire posterior pole, which is the important functional region you're trying to um, achieve. In contrast, if you look at some of the volumes and target areas that have been used in other studies, you'll see as little as 10 microliters used and very central delivery. So it's really important if this is going to work and durably work that you do rescue or at least treat the largest possible area and balance that with the safety so that's why this surgery technique is so important. It allows us to really broadly treat that important area with the genetic medicine while being as safe as possible, not making really tight blebs or, or anything that could be deleterious to the retina 
And that's in contrast to others, that volume. And you can go and look at papers that Nightstar published showing the volume they delivered was 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 very, very small um, well, in that's, contrast. That's, that's absolutely right. And so we've, we've allied to that, made great efforts to ensure that the surgeons in our trials are, are optimally trained, optimally supported, and that the um, there's ongoing assessment of their surgical procedures and that they are done in the way in which we found to be the safest and most effective. Got it. I understand. And uh, given that approach um, and, you know, obviously the need for um, stellar safety, uh, do you uh, see, see any inflammation or do you have to utilize any uh, prophylactic regimens uh, to reduce the risk of inflammation? Sure. Mike? Sure, absolutely. So yes, yes, we absolutely do use a, a steroid regime as prophylaxis because um, we inevitably expect to see some inflammation with gene therapy if we don't put that prophylaxis in place. So what we found has made a tremendous difference to the, uh, the immune response that we see, um, particularly when we applied the full regimen to our expansion cohort of our phase one, two, was that we used both topical, oral, and local steroid. So it was the, the addition of the sub on steroid in the expansion phase that had a quite a significant role in, in dramatically reducing the number of um, immune-related AEs that we saw, both in terms of number and in terms of the severity of those AEs. So we, we feel the immune prophylaxis we've got in place is, um, is working really very, very well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, so as as you alluded to uh, earlier, uh, your XLRP and several other programs are being developed in collaboration with Janssen. I uh, wanted to ask you uh, if you could share some details about the collaboration and uh, what it brings uh, to to you as a company. Uh, if you can potentially share some responsibilities of each party, uh, costs, and uh, economics down the road. Sure. So the collaboration um, from a very high level was essentially um, around these clinical programs. There were research programs, manufacturing collaboration, but around the clinical programs, the focus today. Um, essentially, the deal was that Janssen pays 100% of the clinical development commercialization of the clinical programs from the time that they uh, signed the deal. Um, and they then pay us an untiered 20% royalty on all sales globally. So pretty simple, right? There are obviously nuances uh, to the what's 100%, but essentially they pay all clinical development. So from a, a responsibility perspective, this really has been a collaboration. Um, it's been a collaboration both in developing the manufacturing, but really importantly in the clinical trial. And we have um, the what, what's been very important in addressing many of the issues that we're going to mention today has been the collaboration with the Moorfields and Mike and uh, physicians at the Moorfields who have expertise in these sorts of trials, these sorts of endpoints, and really importantly, these patients. So there's a really close collaboration with daily calls between a team that consists of Janssen and Mira for you know, regulatory, for clinical, for each of the functions that's required for clinical development. And, um, and you know, we've been really successful. This is a, the phase three study is a very complicated global study with many sites and mazes all over the world. And, you know, we have a huge support, not only financially, but in that collaboration from Janssen in all the things they're good at doing, which is running studies globally and making sure that they happen effectively and on time. So it really is a, a very positive collaboration outside of just the finances, which are clearly um, positive for Mira. Oh, one you. more thing. Yes. We we are we are the commercial manufacturer. So that's a whole addition 
to that 20%. We manufacture clinical material. We are the commercial manufacturers. So there will be a uh, cost plus on commercialization. And, um, and that having a BLA ready program to discuss with global reg regulatory agencies around your CMC has really put us in a position as a company with the ability to make commercial product, have relationships around commercial products with regulatory agencies. And indeed for QC, we now have actually a commercial approval. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, so I, I wanted to uh, jump into uh, the clinical uh, data uh, for, for that program. So last year, uh, you presented phase one, two data, um, and uh, you presented immune response data earlier this year at Arvo. Um, so so for, first, before we talk about the actual data, can, can you outline uh, the design of the study? And um, second, uh, pro provide the highlights of the results or key take takeaways. Sure, Mike, yeah. go ahead. Absolutely, yeah, happy to. So, um, so our phase one two trial was conducted at five sites uh, in the US and the UK. There was a um, a conventional dose escalation phase in adults, uh, where we had three uh, adults in the low dose, four in the intermediate dose, and then three in the high dose. And then following safety being established, we moved to a dose confirmation phase in children. And so three children received the intermediate dose. We then developed a, a randomized controlled expansion phase, and that was a cohort of 32 adults where we randomized patients into, into group in terms of whether they received immediate treatment or went into the concurrent control group. We randomized them into dose, into whether they received low or the intermediate dose, and also randomized them into eye, whether it was their right or left eye that received treatment. In terms of sort of some of the take home messages, um, we were able to show uh, a, an adverse event profile that would be anticipated and manageable. In terms of efficacy, we demonstrated that eyes treated with our gene therapy improved in both retinal sensitivity and functional vision in terms of the vision guided mobility maze in comparison with those randomized control patients at six months. And we also able to show that um, some uh, PRO measurements were trending positively. Got it. Thank you. So, so in in terms of um, you, you know the the elements from this study and maybe uh, some additions based on the learnings from from that that study, what gives you the most confidence in the ongoing phase three uh, Lumia study? Sure. No, absolutely. So, so it's the fact that there are several. Um, things that give us confidence. One being the fact that we saw uh, benefit, often statistically uh, meaningful improvements across quite a broad range of assessments. Um, and the fact that some of the most robust assessments, namely those of retinal sensitivity and vision guided mobility um, showed improvements is very reassuring. The fact that we were able to demonstrate improvements in, in retinal function, both with static perimetry and micro perimetry so do different devices of making that measurement and also the fact that we could see those improvements whether we looked at the data in terms of mean retinal sensitivity or a point wise responder assessment or a hill of vision measure they all pointed positively to having a treatment benefit and then we were then able to see that that retinal function resulted in patients able to navigate the maze more effectively the PROs told us that the patients were also behaving better in real life. And then when we spoke to our patients and the majority of the patients in phase one, two were from, were from the London Moorfield site, um, they were telling us um, how they were able to uh, function better in low illumination. They were able to go out more independently, um, how their central clarity had improved, how they were able to uh, do sport more comfortably, work uh, more effectively in, in the workplace. Um, and I guess two main things that, again, add even more strength to that belief that the, the data is, is robust and gives us confidence that the phase three study will be successful is the fact that in our expansion phase, it was a randomized controlled 
uh, phase of 32 patients, um, where we were comparing patients who were treated with those who were concurrently um, observed with deferred treatment. And so I think that's that's very robust. And moreover, given the fact that I'm sort of patient centric, I've spent 20 years looking after patients with X-linked RP, is that the majority of patients who receive the low or the intermediate dose in the phase one, two, which are the two doses we're exploring in phase three, have been asking, when am I going to get my second eye treated? They want their second eye treated throughout the time. And some of those are now out to four or five years of follow up. And they're still requesting second eye to be treated because the eye we did not treat is now their worse eye. And so that difference has been accentuated by the fact their treated eye has improved. And so they're still asking, when could I have my fellow eye treated? So all those factors make me make me confident. Got it. Okay, understand. And uh, with, with respect to the second eye treated, what what are your plans? Um, you know, to to look into um, assessing that clinically. So so, so we, we go on, Zandi. You, okay. you go. Yeah. No, no, so. No. Um, yeah, yeah, Janssen is uh, looking at the timing of when we were able to do this following the completion of the, the phase three, because it is important to um, really listen to the patients and um, provide that at some point uh, when the phase three has been completed. Got it. Understand. And, and and Mike, you mentioned about uh, the the safety uh, that that you observed was uh, you know every, everything went as expected and uh, what uh, the signal that you did see were manageable. I uh, wanted to ask if there were any findings from the phase one two that um, you, enabled you or um, led you to make any changes for the phase three. Sure, I'll just briefly get a bit bit more flesh to that. So what I was meaning was that the majority of the AEs we saw were related to the surgery, they were transient, they resolved without any treatment. Uh, in, in terms of the SAEs, um, we just had two, we had two SAEs in the dose uh, escalation. One was related to the surgery and that was managed effectively with no further sequelae. And we had one patient who had panuveitis in the dose escalation phase. But in the expansion phase, um, where we modified our, um, our steroid regimen, we found that we saw a lot less uh, AEs due to inflammation. And we just had one patient who had intraocular pressure that needed to be managed and, and that was effectively managed. Okay, understand. Um, and uh, do you expect to pro uh, provide any additional readouts from the phase one two in, in the in the near future? Uh, I think probably not in the near future, but of course those patients continue to be monitored and, and we'll have data at least out to five years after treatment. So we would anticipate that data would be would be made public at, at the appropriate time. That durability, of course, is very important. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, so, so I wanted to move on and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the phase three trial. So you you, you announced recently uh, that the phase three was oversubscribed. So, so the first question and um, I guess I have is, uh, do, do, does the fact that um, you, you have an oversubscribed phase three trial, um, is, is that an indication of high demand of uh, gene therapy for that uh, XLRP indication? So, so certainly the, the male patients want to have this treatment in the sense that they're very aware, given there's often a family history of, of what um, lies in store for them, they know that they will lose all vision by the end of their 30s, beginning of 40s. So that's inexorable. And so they're, they're very motivated and keen to have a treatment that potentially could be a one-off treatment um, that could either stabilize their vision, which otherwise would certainly get worse, or potentially improve their vision. Um, and as I've said, the fact that there's so many are asking for their second eye to be treated again demonstrates the how keen they are to have this. And moreover, we found that there have been patients considering the phase three trial that have uh, you know interacted with other men who were part of our phase one, two trial. And that interaction has led them to be very keen to participate in the phase three. Uh, either directly or through the the multiple sort of social media type groups that inevitably uh, sprout out. Got it. And and in terms of the phase three design, can can you uh, walk us through that? And uh, maybe if there are any additional metrics uh, that are included in phase three that were not part of the phase one two. 
Sure. So it's really very similar, um, especially to our expansion, our randomized expansion cohort. It's a it's a one to one to one randomization between uh, low dose, intermediate dose, or deferred treatment, um, and um, the the the, met, the assessments with the greatest weight are the visual guided mobility maze and our retinal sensitivity measurements. But then we have a host of other assessments, of course, that you would expect, such as visual acuity, low luminance visual acuity, contrast sensitivity. Okay, I understand. Just, so, just so, so thing, Mike, maybe you could mention the improvement of the maze for RPGR and the validation of that maze. Sure, sure, yeah, no, because course. we've done a lot of work. Sure. really improve the maze yeah. and differentiates no. yeah no absolutely so so what we've done thank you so what, what we've done with our maze to to optimize it to be for it to be a, a more sensitive tool um to be able to detect more uh what would be a meaningful improvement for the patients is what we've done is um extend the lighting range across which we assess how patients navigate perform on the maze we've also introduced uh, obstacles of a different nature that will give us different readouts uh, and we've developed a uh, a criteria to assess a pass or a fail of the performance based upon a uh, time to navigate and errors made so um addressing we've had very detailed discussions with regulators to come to this what we now believe is a very a very precise endpoint um, could provide meaningful readouts, and then had to do a lot of work to ensure that this maze is uh, standardised, validated, and re and uh, rolled out to the multiple sites where the technicians are appropriately trained, that the reading centre is appropriately certified to do the grading of the videos as we go through the trial. Got it. Understand. Excellent. And um, so so. As you mentioned, there are a number of um, endpoints you'll be looking at um, in addition to VMA. Um, in terms of uh, maybe patient feedback uh, or doctor's feedback, uh, how um, important or how, how much weight uh, do these other endpoints carry in your opinion? Sure, no, it's a great question. So so I, I'm clearly biased because I, I do spend most of my days with patients. So I would clearly say what the patients are telling me is, is absolutely key. Um, if, if they're not deriving benefit, then what's the point? Um, so what patients tell us is absolutely key. Um, again, we invested a lot of time and effort with uh, some of the expertise that Janssen has, in fact, in this area, in the PRO area. So we've got very well um, uh, developed tools that we, we believe will provide that uh, qualitative data that is very important uh, both to patients, uh, clinicians, and and payers. Excellent, got it. And um, I guess we'll, to to conclude on the uh, phase three, you wanted to ask if uh, if you're guiding for uh, the data readout. I believe uh, you, you're expecting to be late to be filed in 2024. So so wanted to 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 ask you about the upcoming upcoming milestones for that program. So. Um... We, you know, I don't think there's anything more to say than we've publicly said already. So you can appreciate that uh, the enrollment is completing, um, that there's a 12 month endpoint, that uh, BLA filing 2024, um, you can see that timeline and, and derive from that when data will potentially be released. Yeah, that make, make, makes sense. And um, I wanted to conclude on a couple of uh, more more housekeeping and general questions. So uh, first, uh, can you uh, tell us about uh, the company's uh, cash position and uh, what what uh, is the expected cash runway? Um, the I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact cash position from our last quarter, but you can go to our filings. It gets us into uh, the second quarter of 2025 and um and i think i think that's it sorry i don't know the exact number uh, that that's all right yeah and and finally um la last question uh what what do you think uh the investors that are new to uh the mirror story are, are missing about um uh, the the company um uh, and you know the, the key programs and key value drivers so i think that they're at this moment that investors aren't 
really focused on uh, even one of our late stage uh, clinical programs. I mean, we have three late stage clinical programs, each of which has been positive, each of which uses a low dose, each of which is shown to be extremely safe, each of which has very low cost of goods, and each of which has an extremely large market. So just based on the late stage of one of those programs, um, one could argue the valuation, the current valuation of the company is too low. As I've said, we have three of those late stage programs, which are high value, large markets. In addition to that, um, we do have very valuable, in fact, unique uh, manufacturing infrastructure. We don't know of another company, whether it's big pharma or biotech, that has internally end-to-end -end manufacturing all the way from plasmid production for upstream to QC to allow rapid release of, of material. And in addition, has a process development team um, which allows you to get any vector into the clinic. Uh, let's just say, sorry, into manufacturing for the clinic in a four week period of time rather than a six month period of time. Just our manufacturing probably saves about three years in clinical development at this time for gene therapy. And on top of that, we have a uh, entirely in-house invented gene regulation technology, which allows us to control any gene with a small molecule of our choice. And right now we've recently released CAR-T data where it looks like our CAR-Ts are um, really significantly improved over any of the persistently expressing CAR systems out there, which could have a huge impact on the treatment of solid tumors. So. You look at any one of those elements and um, any of them can very readily be valued at higher than the current level. Got, got it, understand. Thank, thank you very much for that overview. And um, I, I believe that brings us to the end of our session. Um, again, I really appreciate you joining us and I uh, look forward to connecting again. Thank you. Great, thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you.